Welcome to the chase. The Chiefs is a white arc podcast aimed at specifically giving you an insight into what makes great leaders and entrepreneurs in a variety of organizations tick. We call them Chiefs. My name is James Chuffatelli, and together with my White Arc co chief, Joe Hands, we're going to attempt to take you on a journey and talk to as many chiefs across as many industries as we can to give you an insight into A, what makes them tick, and B, what makes their enterprises thrive, and more importantly, what they've learned along the way. The Chiefs. All right, so let's, let's roll. Let's roll. This morning, we are so fortunate that we've got the very famous Bernard Salt with us. Welcome, Bernard. Hi, James. We are so excited to have you here today. In the preamble, Bernard was uh, envisaged that I had a red Vesper, and I do. So he he really is a futurist in every sense of the world. So we're really excited, Bernard, to have you today. You're obviously so well-renowned and known. You know, for your corporate advisory work, you're a futurist, a business mentor, you know, a claim speaker amongst many things, but you're really widely regarded across Australia around, you know, your thoughts and, and your ideas around, uh, you know, sort of the future and its impact on the broader community and business and what have you. So today we're really looking forward to having a conversation with you around that. And for our listeners, you may not know that Bernard is also the managing director of the Demographics Group, where he's absolutely focused on insights for business leaders around consumer trends. And he also hosts a great podcast with KPMG called What Happens Next. So again, Bernard, welcome to the Chiefs. Okay. Great to have you. <laughs> so together with Joe, we're going to just ask you a few questions around the future sure. and we're going to open up with a really uh, uh, open-ended one. So what's your personal theme for 2021, Bernard? Well, my personal theme for 2021, and it's certainly something that I have been pushing that I think um, Australian business and the Australian people should also get behind. Uh, there's, there's no end to, uh, to the broadness <laughs> of my thinking. Um, it's something we should all get behind. And this is the idea that 2021 represents an opportunity to rethink how we run businesses and how we even operate our cities, how we operate society. It is not an issue of simply rebuilding Australia because when you think about it, I don't think that the old Australia was you know, perfectly, perfectly managed. I think there is an opportunity in 2021 to think boldly, to think broadly, to think ambitiously about how we can rebuild a better Australia. If you think about it, something like, you know, the way cities operate, Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, Adelaide, Perth, whatever, you wouldn't really have a system where people lived in outer suburbs 50 or 60 kilometres from the CBD and who then commuted in and out every day for their working lives for 35 years. There is a better model and that better model, for example, would be a hybrid arrangement where you travel into work occasionally and you actually work from home or work near home. This is my point, that we can actually conceptualise the building of a better Australia. We would also perhaps focus on issues like the sovereignty of our supply chain, this whole idea of outsourcing everything to uh, cheap labour producing countries to some extent kind of works, but I think that there is a requirement for Australia to retain key capabilities and key manufacturing capabilities on the Australian continent. So big, bold, ambitious, futuristic thinking, that, in my view, is where we need to be in 2021. I don't care whether you're running a corporate empire or a small business. We all need to be thinking grandly and boldly about how we want things to be from here on in. Yeah, it's really, really interesting, isn't it? Because we've gone from people, COVID happening and people saying, how do I protect what I've got? And then when's COVID going to go to, actually, we're never going to go back to where we are, right? We shouldn't want to, right? We should want to reinvent what Australia looks like, but also we should need to reinvent what businesses look like, what companies look like and how we actually work to your point, in the supply chain in Australia, but also how do we work globally, right, and looking at it more holistically. Well, very much so. And, in fact, I think business kind of led the way here. And it's a matter of survival. Um, uh, Businesses went online almost immediately. One of the fastest-growing jobs on the Australian continent between February and August, according to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, 
was the job of a web page developer and yeah. designer. And that's because all of these businesses closed. They couldn't open a shop front anymore or an office front or whatever it is. And so they went online and they had to get a geek to help them online. The geeks are hot or have been hot uh, during, the, uh, during the pandemic, but it has forced business to accelerate into digital transformation in terms of marketing, in terms of staffing, in terms of promotion and so forth. And that then also triggers some thinking, well, if if all of these businesses have gone online, then data, data capture, data analysis, data presentation, data interpretation would be a business to be in in the 2020s. You can kind of, if you understand the bigger picture narrative, then you can work out, well, here's an opportunity for me and my skill set and my business to uh, to carry forward. It's a really interesting, I suppose, concept around this whole digital transformation. And one of the things that's come up a lot in conversations is what we saw is that companies in a crisis were able to move quicker than they've ever been able to move before. So in the past, I'll do a business case and it'll take me eight months and I'll figure out my financials and then I'll get approval and then all of a sudden we'll do some kind of digital transformation. Because we hit a crisis, businesses moved. Does it take a crisis to get a business to move and can we change the pace of change? Well, I, I do think a crisis is uh, very helpful in accelerating change because you have the senior management team, the board of directors, yeah. the business owner staring straight down the barrel and saying, if I do not change, if I do not adapt to this, if I do not find new markets, new methods, new processes, if I fail to learn this digital transformation, then I will lose this business or the business will be fatally flawed. So there is no, there's no greater motivator than necessity or the threat of extinction. And that is, that is literally what I think many businesses, the situation I think they felt that they were in uh, April through to uh, September or so last year. And uh, many of them transformed, you know, with the help of uh, talented staff and con- consultants and geeks and so forth. They got online and transformed. And I think that we are now reaping the benefits of that. Mm. Bernard, I, I love your narrative around uh, building better Australia. And you talk about small businesses in particular. You referenced surviving and adapting to the challenges of 2020 and, and COVID, of course. I'm really interested from your perspective. What's here to stay and what's not? Because so many businesses have pivoted almost on a dime. Yeah. Uh, if you sort of look forward, I mean, many of them have pivoted. Restaurants have pivoted to be, to be takeaway. That's kind of uh, yeah. an easy one. But some have pivoted to being a completely different business. So from your perspective, you know, who are the winners? Who are the losers? What's here to stay? What's not? Well, I, I certainly do think that uh, retail is going through a major transformation just in my suburb in Melbourne, there have been uh, two or is it three news agents have just closed. And you would have to say that the whole, you know, magazine, newspaper, market, logic, and then the, the sellers of that uh, have probably been threatened for, uh, for quite some time. Along comes something like this. And it has just transformed that industry. But I think that there's a whole range of retail that is now rethinking the model and the model of having distribution centres and then shop fronts and then, uh, you know, supply chains servicing those shop fronts, you know, it, there is a better model. This is the, my idea that, you know, there are times when you need to stand back and get up high, get up to an altitude and think, you know, how would you organise society? Uh, how would you organise the whole of the retail industry? Yes, you would, you'd probably keep the uh, you know the major super regional centres you know there's a there's a certain functionality to that that is going to be required but there's a whole range of smaller shops and services shop fronts that I don't think are really going to come back from this because there is simply a better model if you look at the way in which um, the travel agencies for example have been transformed over the last five or six years or so milk bars for example I think have been changed by convenience stores as well as by service stations petrol stations moving into that uh, into that space as well so I think there is a range of services particularly in retail that are going to be reimagined in the 2020s in fact Agree. And in terms of those organisations who, you know, if we think about it from a winners and losers, I mean, 
Uh, have you got some thought? I mean, I'm going to lose it. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> let's let's focus on some winners. That's probably yeah, a good can, idea. Can you find any? Change the mood. Oh, there's uh, there's so many winners, and in fact, um, anyone in uh, in technology, you know, this idea of geek consultancies out in the suburbs, helping the uh, the technologically challenged like myself out yeah. to develop a, a home office as I as I have here. So technology uh, is important. Uh, certainly healthcare, health services is important. I think one of the biggest winners during 20, uh, 2020 was the whole agribusiness sector. And to some extent, that was perhaps prompted by um, the, uh, you know, the hoarding and, and so forth. But I think it was also stimulated by the drought-busting summer rains mm. that we had in January and February of last year. Go to any of the regions, you know, west of the Great Divide on the Australian continent, and those cities are blooming, they are greening, they are, they are attracting um, workers and investment. It's terrific to see, largely due to the farming sector being far more productive. The great opportunity is, well, normally we just, you know, grow the wheat and, you know, crop it, whatever you do, harvest it and then shoot it off somewhere. I think that we can now think bigger and more boldly, you know, how can we add value to this? Should we be investing in the agribusiness manufacturing value-added business on the Australian continent, adding um, the manufacturing processes to places like Dubbo and Wagga and Roma and Meriden in, uh, in Western Australia, so that we're actually not just producing stuff as a consequence of, you know, the better seasons we're having, but also adding value to that. This is my idea that you know, one of the great winners of the 2020s will be smart manufacturing. Mm -hmm. We may not need to know how to manufacture a motor vehicle on the Australian continent anymore. Now, other people might be able to do that, but we sure as hell do need to know how to make a $2 face mask. And so this brings into question this whole issue of supply chain, supply chain sovereignty, and being able to retain the capabilities and the abilities to deliver what we need to deliver within the Australian continent, including, I might add, uh, oil refining and uh, petrol manufacture as well. Yeah, there's been such a focus right over the last X number of years about do we have to do it in Australia and can we do it? Is it cheaper? Is it better? Is it? Oh. And there's been such a focus on, you know, companies figuring out what they, what do they have to keep and everything else gets offshored. And really you go back to the basics and you're rethinking all of that and going, actually, what, what do we want to offshore, right? And I think it really does change a lot of the operating models of companies and industries. But that whole thinking, that whole narrative really, really came to the fore following the publication of a book by a fellow called Thomas Friedman, who wrote a book called The World is Flat in 2005. It was a very simple narrative. And the narrative was that um, every country should focus on what they do best. And what we do best in Australia is lifestyle and property uh, and more lifestyle and more property, I suppose. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, we produce some agribusiness stuff and, you know, some, some minerals, whatever, and we ship them out. We should be really good at logistics. And we, you know, we kind of are. All of that narrative works well until there is a challenge or a shift in the geopolitical bedrock of the global economy. And that is what has happened mm -hmm. with the coming of the coronavirus. It's probably going to happen anyway. Yeah. And so we need a new narrative. Mm -hmm. The whole idea of just in time and outsourcing looked really, really smart between 2005 and 2015, 2020. But between 2020 and 2035, we need a new narrative. What does that narrative look like? And that narrative needs to shape the thinking of every board, every senior management team across the Australian continent. One of my, one of my big themes is that there is no ducking this. There is no squibbing it, as the Australians <laughs> say. Every board needs to, and every business owner needs to think through the geopolitical landscape for the 2020s. And there is not just one there's about two or three different options. You need to think that through and think, what if this happens? What do I do? What if that happens? What do I do? That should be on every board's agenda, I think. You spoke about the narrative for regional Australia and, and for me, what a wonderful opportunity to really bring that back in and that connectivity for Australia. What about on the flip side? If we think about our cities, where Joe and I are also Melbournians, and Melbourne CBD has absolutely been impacted. 
uh, without a shadow of a doubt, office towers are empty and that has a, a flow on effect and, and what have you. And whilst we see the absolute upside and opportunity from a social perspective for regional and people not having to commute in 40, 50, 60 kilometres, what about the narrative for CBD for cities? Well, I must say that that whole narrative of urban life in Australia, I think, is up for grabs. I think it's being changed uh, at the moment. I think that we're going to see the ASX top 200 businesses remain in the CBD. I mean, if you're um, you're in the ASX top 200, you can't be running a business like that from your home office in Glen Waverley, or more likely Turak, or wherever, yeah. wherever it is, I suppose. <laughs> so, so, you know, that whole Collins Street spine for Melbourne yeah. and the equivalents in other cities as well, I think is quite assured. It's the periphery mm. of the CBD that I think is going to be reimagined. It's all the consultants and the contractors, you know, people like me, um, who, yes. who, and, and you, um, who you can't go, do we really need to be there? Yeah. And so that to me, is the is the great shift. But if you take that whole support army, if you like, yeah. of corporate advisors and seed them around the suburbs, then that has an enlivening impact mm. on the suburbs. It's a bit like putting a defibrillator across the fat belly of middle Australia and middle <laughs> suburbia, although I don't think you put a defibrillator on the belly. I think you put it on the chest, but you, you kind of get the idea. And it has enlivened. I mean, I'm here in my study. I look out over a, a street and what has struck me you know, for the last eight or nine months, you know, I'm never here during the day, uh, during a weekday, yeah. is the amount of activity. There's tradespeople, there's joggers, there's people coming and going. It's almost like this, this suburb has jumped into life, has been defibrillated into life. And you think, well, yeah. that's because people are living here 24-7 and running their businesses from suburbia. And so those business activities, you know, those food courts and those consultants and contractors from the CBD, they will find opportunity in key regional centres in the suburbs is, um, is the theory. That would be the narrative I see going forward. So it would be dispersed. And, and what, so what you're basically saying is your prediction is that work from home in some degree is here to stay, pretty much. Very, very much so. In fact, I've been tracking the proportion of the workforce working from home for 25 years, since the 1996 census, when 5% of the workforce worked from home. At the last census in 2016, it was still 5%, despite the fact that we've had, you know, went from dial up to five, three, four, five G, whatever G we're up to at the moment, uh, <laughs> because because there was a, a cultural shift, a block, blockage there. If you're working from home, you're seen as a bit of a bludger. You might be watching yeah. daytime television. It's a bit of a lark, a bit of a lurk. Whereas the big social experiment of 2020 showed that you can be just as productive and in fact, more productive, not everyone, not every job, uh, working from home. And so I think that in the post-COVID world, the post-pandemic world, we won't go back to maybe 5% working from home. It might be 10 or 15% mm. of the workforce working from home. That's a doubling or trebling. Every five percentage points you add to the proportion of the workforce working from home, you take 600,000 workers out of the daily commute. And that has a transformatory impact on the way our cities operate Mm. and on the value of property. That inner city, inner middle garden suburb with a front yard, backyard, three bedrooms, four bedrooms with a home office, that kind of thing. That's the kind of thing that I would expect to see in higher demand as a consequence of the pandemic. One of the things that I think is interesting is around productivity, right? And you see some statistics that say that productivity has increased. And I think in some cases it has, in other cases where, especially if people haven't had the kids at school and all that, you know, I think that that's been a really difficult period for some people. But how do you measure? So as is, if you're a CEO of a company, how do you measure or understand what that impact has been on the productivity? And where do you need to bring people together? And where is it okay to do working from home? Well, the workforce is an incredibly complex machine. And there are some jobs that really are given to uh, working from home, you know, the consultants, the contractors, the the you and I type job. And especially, I think, in your later career, in your early career, you know, in your 20s, early 30s, you you kind of benefit from hanging around 
you know, the senior people in the in the organisation. So that that is an issue. And I think there needs to be ways in which you bring people together. And so I'm predicting a boom in the um, the conference and meeting market that I, that, that I thrive in, of course. <laughs> but you might say that. I'm, I would say that, wouldn't I? But I, I can see the logic. You can see the logic uh, for that. Yeah. You know, maybe a monthly meeting staff, you know, get together, training session or, or whatever. I can certainly see that. But um, but for, for many other jobs, I think that um, they people are more than happy to remain at home and to come into the office or to the workplace maybe once a fortnight or even once a month for maybe half a day, that sort of thing. That is the logic that I would see uh, that I see going forward. As for a CEO, how to discern that? Well, there might be some functionality, some jobs, some arrangements where that hybrid can be uh, can be retained, but it would need to be augmented with staff get-togethers or staff training or staff meetings that uh, build that um, that skills transfer between the generations in the workplace. But Bernard, how would you, just extending on that, mate, our, our middle son is in his VC, his final year of high school, and, and his comment over Christmas, which I found remarkable, but I think it sort of uh, relates to everybody, is he said, Dad, whilst I was online every day through year 11 and what have you, I've never felt more disconnected to my friends, to my social group, to my to my teachers. And, and I think the same can be true for, for businesses and workers. How do we actually solve that problem of augmenting connection? Well, look, I know to some extent we've all marvelled at how technically proficient we have become. You know, here we are doing a Zoom call or whatever it is. Um, <laughs> but the, the reality is that we are social creatures. Human beings are social creatures. We do need to meet and chat and look at people eyeball to eyeball and and so forth. So there is that need. I suppose the question is, do you need that stimulation with the same group of people every day, every working day, if they're not family. I mean, you you do it with your family, of course, but do you need it every single day? And I think that's the great discovery as a consequence of the coming of the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. Yes, we certainly do need some of it, but maybe um, two, three, four days a week, we we don't need that. And when you look at the commercial advantage of that, in terms of, you know, not taking up as much office space, I suppose, then you know, it's a great incentive to do that. It does raise some other issues around privacy of data that I don't, you know, need some sort of major test case. I mean, someone working from home, accessing the work computer, and then somehow it sort of leaks out into other technology in the home and then, you know, there's a data breach now, that sort of thing, you know, I could see an event like that, you know, 2021, 2022, and all of a sudden, you know, the, the shutters come down on work from home. You know, that is a possible pathway into the uh, into the future that uh, could change the trajectory we're on at the moment. But for the moment, I think many people will continue to pursue working from home. Yeah, and it's interesting, um, you know, some of the clients that I'm working with at the moment and, you know, I've been on the... Zoom calls and Teams calls them last week. They're still down at their beach houses and families are still down at their beach houses. They can, they can go and sit in their room and do work, right, for the day and then they can go and have lunch with their families and dinner. So all of a sudden this whole, well, I, do I actually have to come back from summer break or actually because I'm not coming back to an office, does it actually matter? Can I actually sit down at the beach house, right, that I own? The rumour is that Bernard was down at his beach house on a little red Vespa, by the way. <laughs> no, no I, don't, I don't own a beach house. I rent a beach house. Um, but um, but this, this goes to the, to the other point around the booming regions and certainly the sea change, the tree change communities have absolutely boomed, particularly in Victoria, yeah. that had such a harsh lockdown over the winter and autumn. And so the you know the beach that I was at over the last over summer was apparently absolutely chockers yeah. right throughout uh, winter with all Melbournians re- you know going down to their beach house and simply uh, remaining there. And I think that it has opened up people's thinking to well you know could could I do this mm. uh, on a, on a permanent arrangement or a more permanent arrangement. And this is the whole, you know, virus escapee seeking provincial Australia, the VESPA movement, 
um, <laughs> people people scootering out of capital cities in search of their very own Bonnie Doon escape with good internet connection. <laughs> That's basically what they want. <laughs> good internet connection is the key. You're right. Exactly. Yes. Yes. That's interesting. One of the things that you know I've been thinking a lot about and talking to our clients about is this capability shift as we reinvent, as we rethink, as we rebuild the new world, actually the capability that organisations have today may not be the capability they need for the future. And so this whole war on talent and what what is that capability piece and, you know, how a company is going to really tap into that is going to be really interesting because in 2020 they really closed down the batches. A lot of people didn't hire people and they were trying to save their money. But now I think there's a real thing around capability and and getting the right capability in the organisations to rebuild. Well, I think this is uh, very much the case and many of the capabilities to some extent had been outsourced. So um, in smart manufacturing, well, we outsourced that entire industry to um, cheap labour producing manufacturing countries. Uh, Well, we kind of need that back. We want that capability back and we need the skills around that. Now, we either need to hire those people, um, which puts them in great demand. We also need training. And that would be a major industry, a business to be in 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 the 2020s, to skill up people, to train people in the right skill sets that we had been outsourcing for the last 15 years or so, as well as other skill sets around data, data management, data capture, data visualisation, and data interpretation. Uh, The 2020s is really going to be the decade of the geeks, the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics graduates who will give us the technical wherewithal we need to steer Australia into a different path where we will be more productive and more efficient and more independent than we have been in the past. Yeah, it's interesting. And one of the things is a little bit of a steer, but... There's this whole thing, okay, so you're rethinking, you're rethinking what Australia looks like, you're rethinking what your business looks like, right? And every consumer and customer is rethinking the way they have done things. So what my customer wanted in the past or my consumer wanted in the past has changed. How do you as a business owner get your head around what that change looks like and how to pivot your business around that consumer customer change? Well, the way you get your head around change is to be open to the idea of change and to surround yourself with people that do think differently and laterally. I think one of the most dangerous lines of thinking is that um, we just need to get through this and then and things will be back to normal. Back to normal is a three-word catchphrase that is incredibly dangerous. We do not want to go back to normal because normal wasn't efficient, it wasn't sustainable, it wasn't equitable, you could argue, and it wasn't going to take us to where we need to get to. Yeah. We need to stop looking down at the next three months yeah. and raise our vision and say, where do we want to be in 2030? Yeah. What sort of Australia do we want to be? We want to be sustainable, we want to be productive, we want to be connected, we want to be sovereignly independent, we want to be provide opportunity for more people. How do, we, how do we engineer that? What do we need to do now? Who are the people? What are the generational traits that we need to take us there? And uh, I will say that I think this is, uh, this is the uh, pushing it fairly on the shoulders of Generation X and the millennial generation to actually deliver that because they are the ones that are going to steer the productive economy through the 2020s, hopefully to a better place by 2030. Bernard, I can't thank you enough. I, I love the, the way you framed up around this is our opportunity to build a better Australia. I know in the preamble today, you you know, you said if we were to build Australia as we had it pre-COVID, we probably wouldn't have built it that way. I never thought about that proposition as such. I thought it was magnificent. And what a wonderful, positive narrative for all of us and for the one million plus small businesses and entrepreneurs and what have you to actually, you know, lock arms and build a better Australia. So thank you for, for sharing just, I mean, that, because I think that in itself, there's so much hope in that. My pleasure, James. Thank you for that. And thank you, Joe. Great fun. Always, um, always good to talk big picture yes. about Australia and Australia's future. And I think the other question you could ask is about having faith in Australia's future. We might not know precisely where we're going to be by 2030, but I have faith that Australia will prevail, that we will prevail. 
might be I might be wrong, but if I'm wrong, I'm delusional because I genuinely believe <laughs> that that we are a fundamentally good product. Wouldn't want to be anywhere else. No, and I think what we've what we've seen in the last eight months, right, is the resilience and adaptability of Australia to be able to move and businesses and people and personally be able to move and pivot and change and really rise from this, right, stronger. And I agree with James, I think, you know, as we kind of wrap up, I really love your whole branding around rethinking Australia and actually not building back to what it was, what normal was, cross normal out, there is no normal. And actually, how do we use this as an opportunity to build the the better way of doing things? How do we take the good out of what we have and think about what does the new world look like and that clean sheet of paper? You know, a lot of times we don't take the clean sheet of paper, we roll our strategies, we roll our strategic plans, we roll our budgets and we don't think about the clean sheet of paper. And I think boards and CEOs and executive teams need to have a clean sheet of paper on rethinking what their businesses need to look like and how they're part of rethinking that Australia and being part of driving what that looks like. So there's significant opportunity for people from an employment perspective. I think you're right on training. And I think, you know, your whole theme around rethinking and being bold, right, being ambitious and being bold and getting out from hiding and start actually driving, you know, whether you're driving your Vespa or you're driving your BMW or you're driving your Ford, it doesn't matter, but driving and taking charge of where your company is going to land, where your company is going to fit in to the overall ecosystem for Australia. So it's been absolutely a pleasure to talk talk to you. I know that we've got a White Arc event coming up in Melbourne at the end of March and you're coming to speak at that. So we're very, very excited to have you there. And, and thank you so much for your time today, Bernard. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks so much, Joe. And thanks again, James.